So hello and welcome to today's seminars uh, hosted by the International Inequalities Institute. My name is Fabrício Mendes Fialho and I'm a research fellow at the LSE International Inequalities Institute. Uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be chairing today's seminar titled A Far Right Front Runner in the 2023 Argentina's General Election, who are Javier Milei's supporters, which is part of the III Inequalities Seminar Series. So today, our speaker is Valeria Anabusco. Uh, Valeria is an adjunct professor at the National University of like Córdoba in Argentina. Among several other publications, she is one of the co-authors of the book Brokers, Brokers, and Clientism, the Code of Distributed Politics, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, may I ask our online audience to please keep yourselves muted? Uh, as usual, there will be a chance for you to pose questions the speaker uh, following the presentation. We will take questions from both in-person and online audience. Uh, Valeria, many thanks for accepting the, the invite to share your results from this very important topic. And I will hand, hand it to, over to you now, Valeria. Many thanks, all enjoy the event. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Emma, Fabricio, Peter, everybody there. I would like to share a presentation, but I think uh, you need to allow me, or at least that it's what it says here. Is that possible? Because it here says I'm not habilitated. You make them yeah, it just might be a second. Yes. Um. Okay. Yes. Yes. There we are. I hope I can I can do it fast. You have to stop sharing you don't have to make your host, you can just right click on the share down there. Thank you. Oh, on the, on the right, there. there's a little button. Yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I think I'm here. Is it, there? I? <laughs> Is it there? Yes. Yes, we can, we can see the slides. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, good morning for me here. It's 8.30 and good day for you all there. And let me show some insights about what's going on uh, four days to our big day, election day, next Sunday. Uh, the, the name we've given to this is a far right front runner for the elections, who are Javier Millet's supporters. That's our name today. This is uh, Javier Millet's uh, very recent elected uh, Congress person. Uh, he was only elected in 2021. Before then, he had no political activity. And this is a graphic that shows uh, the, the red line is how his coalition or his party called Libertad, um, Liberty Advances uh, it has grown and, and rise so fast. The blue, the light blue line is the officialism, the Peronist coalition in power and with a candidate that it's the current Minister of Economics. And the yellow one is a traditional opposition party, the central right called Juntos por el Cambio. Let me tell you a story. I'm sitting at a, at a private bank's waiting area on Monday, 10th of October last week, the day after this presidential candidate, Millet said publicly, it's not safe to have pesos. The peso is the currency the Argentine politician produce. And because of that, they're useless and worse than excrement, textual words. Next day, some people rushed to the banks and took their deposits out to exchange them for dollars. 
There I am to make arrangements for my trip. Next to me, a young man accepts my conversation, even when I tell him I guess he's a Millet voter because of age and gender. He accepts, he likes Millet, though he may not even go to vote. Um, the use of cell phones is forbidden, so we go on talking. He tells me he's a football player. He has played for two Bolivian teams. And I take that to speak about Bolivia. And I say, well, you know, Bolivia is better. And no, he says Bolivia is better. And so I tell him that he probably knows it is an interventionist country with lots of regulations, socialist policies. That could be true, he says, but I, doesn't, I don't care. The problem here in Argentina is how much they have stolen. Whenever those amounts are known, it is a lot of money. This is going to be all right. His grandfather, 70, was a Peronist, enjoys politics, and has told him this is good, referring to Millet. He keeps on going, uh, giving good reasons to support the candidate. He says things in your face and with a solid base. He's going to correct everything when he wins. But when he wins, there will be chaos. People will loot. It is the first time I hear the argument. So I ask him, why would they loot if their candidate has won? He says, those who don't like him will do. I ask him, why are they not looting now if things are unwell? He says that currently government helps people, subsidies and so, but whenever Millet wins, there will be subsidies only in exchange for working. That is what I hear, he says. I don't, I don't, uh, they don't want to work. We will see what happens. And I, I take advantage and ask one more. Why are, are women not supporting him so much? I understand that women don't like Millet, he said. It is bad, we should all, should all be equal. So let me go a quick list of denialisms uh, this candidate has done in this short period. Um, he's, he's denied that the, there was a dicta dictatorship in Argentina, like a, a new uh, interpretation of that period. It was a war and there were casualties. Uh, climate change is part of a natural cycle. He pretends to be a professional, like a scientific, like an economist. So he speaks with lots of figures and data and simply said it's like three cycles, uh, two of them millions of years and only one of them when humans are in the world and that's a natural cycle of heating he's stating that's natural and it's not a problem we don't need to intervene women and men earn the same that's not a problem um he's he said last week or the other in, during the debate that communism and socialism he's not going to um, to commerce with china nor brazil two of our biggest um how do you call it Indeed. countries it took to to buy and sell he's spoken about bare arms uh, easily uh, something is not a problem it's not an issue in argentina he proposed that mar that organ markets uh, should be allowed because free market is the best thing for everything and last but not least, or well, there are so other many things, but moving the embassy, mm -hmm. uh, the Argentinian embassy to Jerusalem, as Trump uh, once suggested. Um, why or what one of the reasons or some context for this uh, situation, this political situation, is uh, certainly economics. Inflation has risen very very much and very uh, in a worrying way as you can see 2023 we are around one 140 percent inflation for a, a year and that brings lots of problems and and frustrations and as you may imagine another problem connected of course to that is people living be uh, below the poverty line i can see it here but it's around 40 percent 
here's only 22, but uh, 2023 20, is around uh, or more of 40%. Uh, one of the things I, I'm honored to be talking with you and I'd like your insights and, and, and to write my agenda, my research agenda with you or take advantage of this, is about inequality. And this is a very simple map taken from newspapers. So it's been debated like in public uh, media about uh, inequalities in the world. Um, so countries that are darker are more in unequal, but Argentina is in the, in the unequal ones, of course. And I think the questions uh, we should be asking uh, from, in, in, from in political science is more of this kind of questions and, and work together, really together with sociologists and people understanding uh, inequality. To, to have to give you some data on everyday life, a minimum wage in October was 132,000 pesos, which uh, to divide into an unofficial dollar because we have an official currency exchange and another one, the current unofficial one, that's the one everybody uses, is a thousand pesos for a dollar. So you would have a minimum wage this month today of $132. I say today because that unofficial dollar is like the temperature of political pressures, of um, campaigning and of political, of economic operations. So last week, the dollar was 800 to one, to one peso. When Millet said this about the dollar being high, it's a better thing because then it would be easier for him to dollarize the economy. And it, risen, it, it rose to a thousand uh, pesos. Today is the first uh, Labor Day. Yesterday was a holiday. And in uh, two hours, the market is opening. So we're all hoping what is going to happen with the economy and the dollar specifically this week and the week after elections. To have a, 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 an idea, you know, of course, that it's not only the, about what you earn, but what you can actually pay with the pesos you have. Uh, renting a very simple two bedroom house is around, I checked yesterday, $180 a month. So what I'm saying is that this context, this socio-economic context, uh, can allow for these things. Maybe we could go back to this, um, or or maybe we do it here because maybe it's necessary now. So our political context um, has been last fifteen, we say fifteen years of high polarized uh, politics. Uh, we had around 15 years uh, of uh, Peronist, Kirchnerist uh, government uh, that coincide with a very, um, with a boom of exports. So there was a good economy in Argentina that stopped around 2010, 2012, and Kirchnerism went on and lost elections 2015. Uh, the coalition that won was a center-right one led by um, a president called Macri. And uh, polariz polarization was very deep. So as you know, in many other countries, we had these two camps and people not talking to each other and people allowing for bad decisions in each of the camps because they weren't uh, able to debate. 
Uh, so we had polarization and bad distributive results. To me, that's one of the main reasons why something like Millet happened. When we, after Macri's government, 2015 to 2019, uh, uh, no elections, he, lo he loses elections. It's the first time a president is not reelected during the democratic period. And again, a coalition close to Kirchnerism, but moderate, a more moderate one, uh, comes to power and starts with lots of expectations and lots of good news, except that for the, the a month later, pandemic starts. It's a very strong, um, close pan. Um, how do you call it? Uh, closing. ¿Cómo se decía? Cuar uh, Cuarentena, quarantine, yes, and and people start being anger and uh, angry and Millet that was being a character on TV because he was very loud and he treated badly, especially especially women, and and so he started being the the one vociferating the anger uh, of us being. Uh, close down he was uh, very good with oops with um social networks uh something that traditional politicians didn't do uh you know tiktok and and um how do you call it? not youtube but the other twitch and all of those other young people's uh, networks and then uh, there are other, uh, Carlos Melendez just published in 2022 uh, in Cambridge Elements uh, book, the idea that it's a new uh, um, identity time and he calls it anti-partisan identity. Po he called them, he calls them post-partisans. And I took that idea from Carlos and even though at the time he prints that, he says that there's not, it, that in Argentina, there's not um, such thing because there are two coalitions. Um, it was just the rising of Millet. And, and so we started working uh, with another colleague uh, here in Cordoba, Marcelo Nazareno. And we started considering what's this pluralism of radical rights. So, we can go back again, but um, comparing or considering populist rights um, in Europe and Trump's uh, right in the States, we could consider that there is another um, radical neoliberal right, uh, the one uh, Millet is proposing, because he is uh, saying that the state doesn't need to exist. And he goes back to this idea of the minimum state. Um, he was, he even called himself anarcho-capitalist, uh, and then he changed to minarchist, so minimum, minimum state. I think I ha we have a picture. Well, this is a picture of him with a, how do you call this, Montosierra's thing? The, Yes, chainsaw. Yes, and and that is in campaign last last month, and it's because it's for cutting back uh, um, expenses in the state and getting rid of. I hope is expenses and not people, but uh, that's a very. <laughs> so, so we started uh, with a with a research group. Um, uh, project in 2021. It was originally a project to help uh, the government. It was a, a public uh, concourse, a public project for many universities that helped from social sciences, helping the government to, to think uh, and help policies uh, during the COVID. So we started uh, asking, and, and we had funds, so we could um, carry on these surveys. 
about everything, about perceptions and beliefs, political thoughts. And, and so there is when we, in August 2021, we were surprised by the magnitude of Millet's support, where when everybody else considered it was a joke, it was a character, it was not serious. So we carried on with uh, going deep on that. And uh, we've had surveys during 2022. And now these are very recent ones. And we are going to uh, carry on one this week. So you're only going to see cross tabs um, for now. So a question I'm working with is if a friend tells you he or she will vote for Millet to see what the guy does, uh, what would you respond? This is like an indirect question. Of course, we asked for the voting decisions, but this one allows us to have um, the idea of the, so the support the, the, to, to a candidate and not the voting just the voting. So that we have two uh, good and two bad ones. Yes, it would be good to see what he does as president. Maybe it's not bad, but it seems a bit risky to me. I think you're screwing up. There are other similar but more sensible options. You are crazy. He can destroy the country. So I'm working with uh, two categories, Millet, Bien, and negative ones. Uh, this is the, the picture I was... Um, uh, one of <laughs> and, and that was suggested to me by Fabricio because I I, I forget about all of this. Um, that's him. I don't know, but there's a culture of a thing called cosplay. I don't know if it's an English word, but they use it here something. And it's people that get dressed and go to, I don't know. I don't, I, I need to find more about it. But him and his main uh, image uh, um, consultant called Lilia are cosplayers and and sometimes or were cosplayers and so that's generally ANCAP, anarcho-capitalism. So he, he supports us um, <clears throat> among in this survey 61% are male and uh, they double the support when they are from 18 to 29 that um and of course it lowered down with age <clears throat> that was very strong at the beginning but it's and now it's a lot more general but the, the the male thing is is still there he's he calls himself a lion i don't remember why there was a lion figure because he ah because he's going to he wants to eat lambs. I, I don't remember, but that's a, there's some idea there. He's he's strong. He's lion or something. He uses the style of a rock star, and in and that's an um, a rally. Okay, so um, some of these questions that we asked, um, why uh, you voted for him. This is uh, ordered in magnitude. So the first reason is because I hope that the country will finally move forward because I agree that's 31% of them. This is crossed up with Millet supporters because I agree with his, there's a mistake, his libertarian ideas such as dollarization and privatization, 19%, because he wants to end the political caste that sunk us as a country. That political caste name taken from some other places and reused because he's the only one who proposes something different, 14%. And then very, very small ones. He knows about economics and fed up and because the rest, I don't like the rest of the options. Uh, let me move this, okay. Um, I don't agree. Uh, what do you think of the Fed? So we asked some other questions to understand what their ideas are in general of the feminist movement. And the ones that support Millet say, 50% of them say, I don't agree with anything they do. While the ones that don't support him say 26%, they don't agree. I only agree with some of the things they do. Uh, among Millet supporters is 41. 
And I agree with everything, or I agree with, I agree with everything it says to, no, I agree almost with everything and with everything it's very low among uh, Millet supporters. So even though we have some support to the feminist cause that's very strong in Argentina, you can see the difference among supporters and non-supporters. How could I take this thing out small here? So what makes you most angry about this list of things? We are exploring the reasons why people identify with a man that yells and is very angry and, and you know, do bad, uh, sad passions, times, or zeitgeist in this, in, in our world. So anger is not a, a, a small thing. So the, the highest, uh, reason or the, the the main reason is that there are public employees who are paid with all without almost working mm -hmm. among uh, Millet supporters and this is among non-supporters that the piqueteers block the avenues you know social protesters in Argentina are called piqueteros and that's the second place 29 percent the judges don't pay income tax um, and here is an interesting thing because about, among non-supporters is very high because it's a very unequal uh, redistributive thing. Uh, but for Millet supporters, anything related to taxes is bad. So even if very rich uh, judges in Argentina have like the highest salaries. Uh, some men, some women unfairly blame men taking advantage of the rise of feminism is 12% for Millet supporters and nothing in the other side. And then there are others, the others are very small, but we offered the, the, the options. Manteros are people that put their piece of cloth and sell things in the sidewalks. And sometimes are people from other countries and sometimes are people from our country. Uh, the, the men earn more than women in the same jobs that are businessmen who take the money out of the country. Consider here 30% of non Millet supporters. Uh, this is a, a, a strong problem in the country, ev ev tax evasion and, and taking money out, taking dollars out of the country. In difficult and in cri uh, crisis times like now, what do you think? Because we're we're th trying to think what are the expectations and the way people considers things would come to a solution. So first, uh, thirty two percent people of Millet say we have to hit rock bottom. Everything will explode, and then we will start to improve, which is not a very original. Mm, idea in other uh, far right uh, candidates and countries, this idea works. Um, only little by little without breaking anything and working together, we will get ahead. Surprisingly, uh, there's another 32% of Millet's supporters and double of them is uh, non-supporters. It is very difficult for us to move forward collectively. The important things are is that each one makes their own path and achieves a good life. The individualistic stance is 14% here. Only God can get us out of this situation. 13% of Millet's. And this, there's no solution. Uh, there's always, we always be in crisis. And it's a 10% of non Millet supporters. I'm Oh, I'm I'm hypothesizing. I'm imagining that the Millet supporters think there is a solution, and the solution is Millet. That's why we have this low here. How do you feel your children will live in the country when we leave them? Uh, the country that we will leave them about expectations and hopes uh, among supporters. Their first choice is they will live worse than us. So. 51% consider bad bad future and no uh, no hopes of social mobility it will be the same for 27 of them percent of them 
and they will live better 22%. So there are some that are hopeful. And so now regarding taxes, which phrase best represents your way of thinking? And I, and I, I quoted them again. Uh, and then among supporters, 72% consider that rich business people taxes should be lowered. On the contrary, among non-supporters, 67% think there should be harder rules on business people's tax evasion. So taxes, evasion, and being, being soft or nice with rich business people are a strong divide. And then now how, for the future, how would Belay's government be? Um, he will be able to impose uh, quite a few of his ideas because he's going to negotiate with Bullrich and Macri, this is the central right, and the businessmen. So 34% uh, hope for that. And 29% says he will be able to carry out all of his ideas, but he will have a lot of, because he will have lots of support from the population. He will not be able to carry out the majority of his proposals. So it, this is a very strong thing People are voting him, even no, even though they consider he is not going to be able to carry his proposals. And then very little of them, uh, but high in their non-supporters. There will the country will be in chaos and will have to leave. He'll have to leave before the first year of government. He will be able to impose his ideas in an authoritarian way. This is. Uh, Bolsonaro, that, that's a yesterday picture that Millet posted in, on Twitter. They have very good relationship and uh, Bolsonaro's sons are very close to Millet's social network, uh, head of the campaign. And that's supposedly a book. I haven't read his books, uh, but some people say they're copied. How do you say? Pla plagiados. Uh, they, he I takes ideas. So a scene that continues about the bank, uh, in the bank with this uh, guy, this young guy, we talk about dollarization. He says, I don't want pesos no more, dollar, everything in dollars. He has told me his chance to play belongs to the Bolivian football clubs and the transfers uh, is to be paid in dollars, which is very expensive for local Argentinian clubs where he now wants to play. So I asked him, how much would a dollar cost if Millet would, would dollarize? And he refers to times when Argentina had a one-to-one -one peso dollar currency in the 90s, in the 1990s. And I say, yes, of course, I'm I'm old. I, I remember you don't you were not here. And dollars came because we had huge loans. It was a system built over those debts and, and unemployment and extreme poverty were very high. And it all blew out in twenty one in two thousand one. Now we aren't capable of more loans because we have already the highest loan in the world from the IMF. And since there are no dollars, how is he going to dollarize? A dollar may cost a thousand pesos. I I ask him. And and then I exchange my salary and I say I would be earning such and such and he's very silent and he laughs at me at, at the figure of my salary so in our survey we asked how would you imagine dollarization would be and half of Millet supporters 53 percent say economy will be stabilized and inflation would decrease then a smaller percentage say everything would remain pretty much the same as it is now. So it's bad, but the same. And then our salaries would worth would be worth nothing. This this sixteen percent, I I would like to understand it better. Uh, and then a smaller percentage say one could buy many important things and take trips abroad, and the economy would be ruined, and there would be a lot of unemployment, and that's non-supporters that say this in 38 percent 
So when I was saying that Millet represents, he has signaled a, a way out and many people are thankful and they feel represented. The way out, this is a very provocative idea, is the return to the heterosexual family without abortion, women are less because they take care of what they owe at home, morality, the traditional order. So I, I go back to Wendy Brown and, and the idea of morality and the conservative order. And then some more, I, I shouldn't say funny things, but he seriously says he's inspired by Moses. I don't know if he said Moses in English. He says Moshe, he pronounces Moshe, and has seen three times Jesus' resurrection that I saw in the, in the news. And God told him uh, not to stop until he becomes president. Uh, well, so questions about political reconfiguration is about parties, what will happen with these two main coalitions in Argentina that no longer are half and half. Uh, one scenario is the, part, the divisions in Peru. Uh, another better scene is Uruguay with broad fronts. Um, a past scene in Chile was rioting in the streets, uh, right? No, it's not riots. Uh, riots was in Chile, manifestations in the streets. It's not riots, the word. Um, people um, protesting in the streets and asking for a change, a change that backlashed because after the election and the beautifully planned uh, parity constitution, uh, the, 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 the meeting for the constitution was in the first time in, in, in the world, half men, half uh, women. And then they voted no. And the main vote was for a, a far right candidate. Or another ex ex example in Brazil, we, we all know, uh, extreme right and then the resistance and the coming back to power from Lula. But Millet doesn't have all, some or all of the elements that are here. He has no party, he has no with whom. So it's, it's uh, very doubtfully he, he could govern. So what, what I'd like to, for you to tell me is about uh, inequality question, uh, inequality ideas. The, hip, the main question for me should be about how inequalities is working. Uh, we are designing a question now for this new um, survey and we present occupations and we would like to know how equal or opposite are their economic interests in relation to your interests. And so we asked them about the large businessman, about um, factory worker, a bike food delivery person, a person who works with a computer from someone outside the country and is paid in dollars, or someone who works in a green space maintenance and receives compensation from a state assistance program, trying to measure inequality and feelings toward same or different economic interests. Then another, another thing we need to develop is about men and how they feel towards feminism and the need for something about identities uh, among men and maybe young men uh, that we need to measure. And I'd be happy if you help me with that. Well, some technical information and and thank you so much. And that's for it for now. If if we can talk, it'll be a lot better. I'm not sure. I didn't check any of the time. But... You, you oh. Very well, Valeria. Mm -hmm. Exactly the forty minutes that we uh, uh, we mentioned we chatted before. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. No, you can hear me better. Uh, but uh, thanks for the presentation. I will open now the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, we have some questions from the online audience, and I will open the floor for colleagues who are in the room. But before that, I'd like to note two things that you didn't mention in your presentation about Millet. 
One is that uh, Millet uh, recently, well, Millet never allows women to go into his home, right? And, and if he's elected, the first lady of Argentina will be his uh, sister. And that uh, when you talk that Millet uh, uh, talks directly with Moses or get his message from uh, Moses, uh, I found it uh, a bit strange because I saw Millet recently saying that his main political advisor is his uh, dad dog with whom he talks with uh, via fortune teller. Right, so these are perhaps very important issues to understand what, <laughs> where he gets these, these political ideas from. But uh, let me see, uh, we have an online question here. Uh, where do these surveys have been conducted in Argentina? So it's a question on how you got your data. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we have one question here and Armin, uh, yes, your name and the question please. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Devakar, I'm a PhD student here. Uh, my question was, again, about the survey. Uh, there was strong opinion on uh, taxation policy. Uh, do you have data on uh, the demography of the people who have strong opinion on, on, on taxation? So the survey participants, where do they lie in the income distribution in Argentina based on what they believe in? I, I'm not sure I got that. On democratic ideas of people that consider taxation? No. Just a second. You get closer to the microphone, I think. Thank way. you. Hi. Can you hear me better? Yes. Uh, the demographic characteristic. Ah. Ah. So the income distribution of the survey participants and connecting it to the tax preferences that they have of whether there should be higher taxation or lower taxation. Okay. Thank you. When two questions? Or... Yeah. Okay. So you can answer these two questions first and then we have another round. Okay. So there's a... Um, yes, we have demo, uh, demographic, uh, I don't have them here. Uh, uh, the surveys were conducted um, uh, online by a way of Instagram and Facebook offers. Um, with it, it is, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the technical note. It is uh, in a way that is, um, um, Aleatorio. Um, random. Uh, the, random. 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 Randomly, of course, uh, the the areas, urban and and rural, and in all the country. And we are. It was the first time in twenty twenty one when we started with this, and during pandemic. And I was not confident on with this method, but uh, after elections we could prove that our results were very uh, adequate. So we, we got the same figures uh, in voting patterns. Uh, so I can show you, and I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, of course, this data can be shared and, and we can consider this and ex examine better the taxation uh, idea. I would, I would, um, uh, I would risk that a taxation would go across demographic uh, um, patterns, uh, social demographic patterns, and only would be um, in, uh, modified by political positions. So if people would be uh, Kirchnerista, Peronista would be better uh, towards taxation <clears throat> than the center-right and right uh, voters. Uh, then about Fabricio's questions, I'm not sure we need, or I mean, not sure, of course we need to speak about it, but it's so absurd that, uh, that it's, he is a character, he has these issues with uh, talking to their dog his dog de his dead dog because he then clonated that loved dog and he has four sons of that dog and that's a public story and everybody knows that he talks about these dogs 
Then there, there's a book written by uh, Juan Gonzalez, an author I don't I don't know, but it's a nobody has said it was a bad book, and and he tells the story that the, he lived with these four dogs in his small apartment. These dogs are English mastiffs or something like that, big dogs, and so and he he tied them in with with clavo I don't have to say in the in the floor so that they don't fight with each other <clears throat> in an apartment so I'm not sure if the, he he didn't allow for women to come into his apartment because of other reasons or because he had it full of dogs and smell that's what the book tells um so so it's so it's been so serious this this issues that one of the candidates suggested that maybe there should be a psychological exam as, as to get into any other company to work to be um, a candidate for for president. So I I don't know how what else to say. It it is a very provocative and strange, in my point of view, way. Uh, he now announced that he has a girlfriend. Uh, last week, uh, uh, he she's um an actress. She's an actress that uh, imitates politicians, and she's very good at imitating. For example, she imitates former President Christina Kirchner. She imitates uh, many, many candidates. So they were at the, uh, the show, at the TV show, showing their love. It was like an acting thing, no? He needed somebody, a woman, to be on his side. And yes, his sister is, um, is she call, he calls her the chief. There's a there's a thing he has told lots of things lots of uh, times that he had a terrible um, childhood. There, his parents were very violent. His father was very violent with him, and that he didn't talk to him to them. And I think he even said he hated them or something. He stopped saying that this year. But there were some stories about that and that his sister was always on his side. So maybe that's the story, a very a person that suffered a lot in a very ugly family. And and who could blame him for that? So, uh, yeah, thanks, Valeria. I, I, it, it was just a provocation. And now I, I learned there's more about his persona than I, I, I knew before this chat. <laughs> uh, we have questions from Ar 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 Armin. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much, Valeria. <laughs> and, and, and informative and interesting uh, presentation. So my, um, I have a comment and a question. One is, you know, I think it's interesting that you're looking at this relationship between um, income, wealth inequalities and, and how it shapes or informs political behavior and opinions. Um, it, it's it's interesting because you know he's he, he's kind of playing on both kind of left wing but mostly right wing I, I ideologies here, but it's not clear where he's necessarily because you know kind of bringing in the anarchism seems to be quite you know not something that we generally connect unless we're talking about libertarianism, but you know the anarchist kind of rhetoric that he's bringing in seems to be more of the left. But the question I have for you, because of so much of the discussion of, you know, Moses and Jesus, whether you have looked at theories of millenarianism, because the millenarian theories um, were looking at how in several, you know, post-colonial countries or countries that were kind of going through post-colonial struggles, there was a very deep founded belief that the end of the world is coming, everything is going to change, this is preordained, you know, and so on and so forth. And very much informed again by religious ideologies and beliefs. So I, I, I would suggest you might want to take a look at that. And on that point as well, you know, um, I, 
I noticed that he called the the Pope a filthy leftist, which I was like, okay. Um, but he seems to himself also be aligned with some kind of religious movement. Is he, you know, associated with the evangelical church? I mean, I mean, is this even open? Because I remember reading somewhere that you know some of the far right movements in Brazil, particularly, were supported by Pentecostal evangelical churches in the United States. So I'm just wondering, because of this religious element, if there's anything you know here with that. Uh, and you have uh, one more question. Uh, can you, uh, there's a microphone in front of you. If you Hi, you. great. Um, so thanks very much for this presentation. I was wondering, um, uh, my question goes in the direction of what can this case of Argentina tell us about sort of this relationship between inequality and voting? Because, um, my sense is that we usually tend to think that candidates such as Millet, as you described him, would be would thrive in uh, unequal environments. So this link between right wing populism, say, um, and um, inequality. But from the graph that you showed from the map, my sense was that Argentina wasn't sort of the most unequal place, say, in that region. It seemed to be comparatively equal. Um, sort of in terms of, of inequality. My, my question is, does that mean we have to kind of reconsider how we think about this relationship between inequality and voting? Does it mean that, um, or is this sort of just a very small margin, the differences between countries? Is Argentina actually not that much different in terms of inequality from the other countries? Or is there are perceptions of inequality um, that are very um, different in Argentina? Can you tell us something about that from your survey? Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, to start with, by the last one, because if not, I'm going to forget. Um, even if uh, I wouldn't say that the causal variable would be inequality, yeah, and precisely because what you said, um, I would say it's an intervene intervening probably variable. Uh, the what Carlos Melendez is uh, saying when he speaks about this new post-partisan identities is that um, it's a very active attitude against traditional, he calls them established parties. So it's not being apartisans it's, or apoliticals, but it's being political in a new way, in a, in a way of active rejection. He um, studies it in various countries in Latin America, and in not all of the countries emerges an activating leader. And what we have in, in Argentina is that case, that activation was led by someone that connected because of all these other reasons. And so he, he conduced that. Um, I, I agree with you that it's not, it, that our society in Argentina has been uh, had a, a middle class and is not the standard unequal uh, Latin American country it used not to be. Things have gone bad and the shrinking middle class and the very uh, visible inequalities may have uh, produced this effect of frustration, expectations, uh, and when high um, inflation is is as high as here, uh, there's no way of of thinking of the future of or, of saving or planning. Uh, kids, uh, young youngsters, only want to get to go out and work in anything else in other countries to get dollars or or um, money. Um, so I wouldn't say that an inequality itself is the explanation, but I think we need to to put it in the model uh, for in political science uh, regressions. Um, then about the religious idea, I I never had considered that of the millen millen and, and it's like his name millennialism. Um, and I don't think, I, I haven't heard of that from him, 
uh, I don't think that evangelicals, because evangelicals are very well organized in Argentina and connected to center-right uh, uh, parties. So they, they would support uh, more of uh, the Bullrich is the name of the center-right candidate. They supported uh, Macri's last government. And so the evangelical movement is not officially in, importantly connected to uh, Millet that I know. He, of course, calls the Pope uh, filthy leftist and uh, uh, signals him as a communist and all of that because he's an, he, because he's an interventionist Pope. He, he wants to intervene in, in social injustice situations. And for him, that's the order. And that should be as, as it is. Um, market should uh, regulate all of that. Um, it's a very old, it's a very antique idea what he's, if you, if you can tell. No? He's, he's speaking about Hayek, Rothbard and so he's a mixture. He sometimes is a libertarian and anarcho-capitalism uh, capitalist. Sometimes is a neoliberal. He's combining all of this, but he's not a populist in the in terms of a, a big state, so a strong state that would protect, for example, the needy. And and so there's another one about income inequality. I think I, I answered all of them or there was one missing. Yes. So yeah, any any other question? Okay. There is one online question or two online questions. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation, Valeria. Uh, based on your previous academic work and the role of party machines in Argentina, uh, I was wondering if you could expand on how party machines and clientelism played a role or not in Millet's victory, eventual victory. Hmm. Well, no, it's a it's a complete change of times. Uh, parties and their or, uh, organizations are very um, weakened. Uh, after the pandemics and after the the bad results in economics, uh, there was a big deception, uh, a big, uh, well, coming back to our house and homes and not uh, working or actively working in politics uh, in, in all aspects of life and the machines as well. And and we are we we see in our surveys that even people working for the machines or or uh, publicly belonging to the machines are voting for Millet. So this is a complete new way of um, individually and virtually connected people uh, through social networks and through new ways of uh, belonging uh, and it's not connected to machines to political party machines thank you valeria uh, is there any other question on i think that we have one more online uh paul you asked the question uh oh yeah go ahead hi thank you um so uh you mentioned that the research being done on the rise of populism and the rejection of established parties in other parts of the world. It seems to me that Argentina is quite different from most other places in that the um, the kind of the mainstream parties, both the center left and the center right over the last 10 years or so, um, really have unfortunately made a big mess with the economy. Uh, so, you know, the, the right wing government, Macri government from 2015, 2019, I think they inherited inflation of around 25%. They doubled it to 50%. And then the current government doubled it again to 100 percent. Of course, now it's getting worse. And so I was in Argentina for a few months earlier this year. And my impression was that inflation was kind of the huge issue dominating absolutely everything else. Inflation with wages very much not uh, keeping up. And so I would think it'd be important to distinguish between, on the one hand, people who actually like Millet for his policies 
And on the other hand, people who just want to reject the status quo because evidently, economically, it is a huge disaster. And specifically in your survey, you um, you asked people at one point, I think, uh, if they supported libertarian policies like dollarization and privatization. But those are actually very different things. So if people really just are upset and you know angry about inflation, you can see why they might think dollarization might be a solution to that, rightly or wrongly, they might think that, whereas that's quite different from a broader libertarian, or he's not really a libertarian, but uh, his other policies, including privatization and all the other, you know, rather wacky stuff. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Paul. Yes, um, the thing with privatization, I think, is uh, because in the message uh, Millet is saying is that the enemy is... Uh, the politicians, this caste w word he's using, and everything the politicians do uh, costs money, and that is the money we need for not having inflation, for not having problems, for having good life. So we need to to privatize to to get rid of politicians doing business. So I'm not sure that that is a, a reason that common people would appreciate in, in with direct impact in their lives, uh, especially young people who don't remember privatization times in the 90s. Uh, but it's the, the whole argument uh, of getting rid of, of politicians. And I agree with you about uh, people probably not liking uh, Millet. We've done a... Um, uh, an analysis of the the ideas in the surveys to to test if it's a consolidated and consistent program that voters have uh, have in their minds when voting or sim uh, supporting Millet, and it's not. So some are anti-feminist, some are not, some are pro one thing, and some are not. So it that's probably because it's very recent. It's 2021, and it could consolidate as a very reactionary position and have a consistent program on the demand. But right now, it's, as you said, a rejection of what is going on, uh, say, uh, inflation, and say this system that I don't uh, tell you because I think we all consider it, but it's maybe it's not. We have in our minds a two a bi monetary system. So everything we say in one currency, our pesos, we are translating it to, to dollars. And dollars is not only one dollar, but there are different exchange rates. So so it's really very annoying to not knowing how much things cost and how much they're going to cost and how expensive they are in dollars. So, yes, rejection is one strong uh, reason to support Millet. Okay, uh, I'm mindful of the time. So, uh, well, Valeria, it's been a pleasure to share the events today and thank you for the presentation. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So, and until next time, uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.